When I was young, <laughs> long time, <laughs> when I was a little tacker, um, I always believed in God. Uh, my parents were not Christians. My mother was a strong agnostic. My father believed in Nostradamus. Um, but my mother came out of a Baptist background and she sent me along to Sunday school to give me some sort of exposure so I could see the other side compared with her. And uh, I always believed in God until I became a Christian. Uh, that was at the age of 14. I, I went to a um, youth rally. There was a speaker who spoke very strongly and a young man called Colin Pierce got up and gave a poem on hell. And I decided I didn't want to go there. So they had an altar call and I spoke to my friend next to me and I said, I'll go up if you go up. <laughs> so I went up. And... Um, as soon as I kind of made the so-called decision, um, I realised the impact of it, how important it was, and how much it could affect my life. So I scratched my head and started thinking, well, is it all true? And so the following week, I wanted, I wanted to believe. So I, I got a piece of paper and I wrote down 14 reasons why I should believe in God. And I brought them along to the Sunday school class the next Sunday and I shared with them. One of the big regrets in my life is that I never kept that piece of paper. I'd love to look back on it now and think, were they reasonable arguments to form a basis for belief? Um, however, I'm pretty sure that the essence of some of the arguments that I'm bringing tonight were in that list of 13 or 14 reasons that I thought through as a 14 year old just from my own perception. I'm going to start with a quotation from Bertrand Russell called The Celestial Teapot. If I were to suggest that between the Earth and Mars there is a China teapot revolving about the Sun in an elliptical orbit Nobody would be able to disprove my assertion provided I were careful to add that the teapot is too small to be revealed, even by our most powerful telescopes. But if I were go to go on to say that since my assertion cannot be disproved, it is an intolerable presumption on the part of human reason to doubt it, I should rightly be thought to be talking nonsense. If, however, the existence of such a teapot were affirmed in ancient books, taught a sacred truth every Sunday and instilled into the minds of children at school, hesitation to believe in its existence would become a mark of eccentricity and entitle the doubter to the attentions of the psychiatrist in an enlightened age or of the inquis inquisitor in an earlier time. So what he is saying there in essence is... Um, you shouldn't really expect to uh, believe something that cannot be proved or disproved um, and that the burden of proof lies on the person who asserts that there is a God. So tonight I'm going to talk about the existence of God. First of all, look at some of the arguments for God's existence, arguments against God's existence. What do Australians believe and what are the fundamental issues that hinder belief. Arguments for the existence of God. Uh, when we talk about arguments for existence of God, there are some that are, are what are called natural theology. So it's looking at the natural world and um, forming arguments based on what we see. And these are natural theology, so they're outside the scope of biblical revelation. So there's uh, some cosmological arguments, teleological argument, the moral argument, the ontological argument. We're also going to look at arguments based on the nature of human beings. The fact that we, well, we seem to have the freedom of the will, we have the ability to reason, we are, feel morally accountable and we have a sense of our own identity which we call consciousness. And then we're going to look at... Um, the argument from the resurrection, which is in the area of special revelation rather than natural theology. 
and also talk about personal experience. <coughs> so first of all, the cosmological arguments. Um, cosmos means the universe or the world. So the essence of the cosmological argument is who made the world. Um, the cosmological argument is also called the first cause argument. So what is the first cause of the world or the universe? Now there are many forms of the uh, cosmological argument, but we're going to talk about two tonight. One is called the Kalam cosmological argument and the other is the principle of sufficient reason. <coughs> this is a uh, Kalam cosmological argument. This is talking about causes. So the, we have three parts to the cos uh, cosmological argument. This is called a syllogism, so it has two premises and a conclusion. So the uh, first two premises are everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist, therefore the universe has a cause. And um, uh, Brian Schroeder is going to talk to this in more detail on the 14th of May. So I'm just going to give an introduction to the argument. So uh, this is called the Kalam cosmological argument, and Kalam is Arabic for speech. And um, the argument was um, first formalised by a Christian called uh, John Philoponus in the 6th century. But it received most of its uh, development by the Muslims in what's called the Golden Age of Islam. And uh, they had a number of uh, prominent philosophers, one of whom was Al-Ghazali, and uh, he actually developed the cosmological argument in a similar to form to the previous slide. So he considered uh, that uh, premise one was intuitively obvious. Everything that begins to exist has a cause. <coughs> and most of his effort went into justifying premise two, which is that the universe began to exist. Now, uh, historically atheists have claimed that the universe is eternal and uncaused, and so most of the uh, opponents attacked premise two rather than premise one. Um, but Al-Ghazali argued that you cannot have actual infinites, that they are absurd and impossible, and so you cannot have an infinite sequence of causes going backwards in time, so there must have been a first cause. But today, premise two is generally accepted for scientific reasons. Um, there's two major reasons. The first is the second law of thermodynamics and the um, second is that the universe is expanding. Um, the second law of third thermodynamics states that um, entropy is always increasing. Entropy is a measure of disorder. So if entropy um, is always increasing, it must have had a starting point when it was at min minimum entropy. Uh, so entropy is a, a measure of the level of disorder. So, uh, for instance, if you let your children go, their room will get untidy. Um, but in uh, terms of energy, it means that all energy is tending to degrade into heat, which cannot be re reused in other forms of energy. Um, so also, um, if you look at uh, stars or a car, a car will run out of fuel because you have high level energy in terms of petrol and it's converted into heat and it can't be reused. Similarly for stars, stars have hydrogen and helium, that, uh, hydrogen that's been converted into helium or whatever, and so it's uh, burning out energy. And so you ask the question, uh, if the universe was eternal, why haven't the stars all burnt out? Well, they're still going, so they can't be infinitely old. Um, so that argument's been around for uh, quite a while, uh, but in the last hundred years, um, they've discovered that the universe is actually expanding, or it seems likely that it is expanding, and that it seems to have actually expanded from a single point called a singularity. And uh, so this implies that the universe that we observe at least must have had a beginning. Now, um, a whole pile of complications have arisen since then in terms of uh, people are suggesting that there may have actually been prior uh, universes prior to this one, which actually generated this one and had an infinite sequence. Uh, so it gets really complicated at that point, but the general consensus is that the universe as a whole must have had a beginning. 
Um, so um, there's, so the, my first point there is that premise two is now generally ex uh, accepted for scientific reasons. Uh, premise one, everything that begins to exist has a cause is now being challenged today. So uh, people are uh, starting to suggest, well maybe the universe just popped into existence uncaused out of nothing. These are common objections to the uh, uh, who made God uh, argument. If God made the uh, universe, then who made God? And the general answer is no one. God is eternal and has no beginning. He is a necessary being. So God was not made or created and is uncaused. So he's the stopping point to the argument. But the, So the argument can be stated crudely in another way. There must be something that is eternal and uncaused Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. That something must be either the universe or God, and it ain't the universe. All right? Therefore, it must be a transcendent being, which we call God. Um, the principle of sufficient reason was uh, developed by a person called Gottfried Leibniz in the 18th century. So it's uh, also a cosmological argument but it is, differs from the Kalam cosmological argument because it's not looking at causes so much as reasons for existence. So uh, Leibniz asked a question that other people would have asked anyway, why does anything at all exist? exist? So he's saying that there, everything has a reason for its existence and therefore the universe must have a reason for its existence. But I won't talk in detail about that at all. Uh, because this will be covered by Perry Forrester on the 28th of May. The teleological argument. Telos means purpose or goal. So is, this is also called the design argument. Um, a very famous form of the teleological argument was produced by William Paley. Uh, he published a particular document called Evidences of the Existence and Attributes of the De Deity. And he used a, uh, an analogy of finding a watch in a field. So he said, imagine you found a watch in a field. Would you conclude that the watch was due to chance or design? And Paley uh, provided many examples of design in nature, such as a human eye. So he looked, looked especially at life and said, look at all the marvellous design. How could this come about by chance? Uh, well, this argument was very influential for a number of years until another man came along called Charles Darwin who published The Origin of Species in 1859. So uh, he provided a, an argument or uh, an attempted explanation to say uh, that the appearance of design um, could come about by, um, or by natural selection or uh, survival of the fittest. And so um, many people were convinced by that and still are. Um, and so this undercut Paley's version of the sign argument. Um, however, in 1973, a man got up at a conference um, and presented a paper on uh, the fine tuning of the laws of physics. And this had enormous impact. And the fine-tuning argument is also called the Goldilocks effect. Um, in other words, the universe is just right in terms of its physical laws and initial conditions in order to permit the development of life. Um, now, I have uh, had a debate with this two meetings ago with John Chandler, so I went into this in a far more detail. Um, but I'll just give a, a few... Uh, points. So the probability the random set of physical laws could be life permitting is vanishingly small. And one particular um, parameter is tuned to 1 in 10 to the 10 to the 1 to 23rd power. This is 1 followed by 10 to the 123 zero. So it's a huge, ridiculous number. And this should be compared with uh, that approximately, that there are approximately 10 to the 80 atoms in the universe. So it way, goes way beyond uh, the number of atoms in the universe, so it's huge. What would be the impact if uh, the universe wouldn't be finely tuned? 
Uh, some people suggest, well, if the laws of physics were different, well, we just have different forms of life. Uh, but it's far more wide-reaching reach, than that. Without the fine-tuning, there'd be no galaxy clusters, there'd be no galaxies, there'd be no stars, there'd be no planets. There'd be no uh, elements, there'd be no molecules, there'd be no life such as trees, and let alone the possibility that human, intelligent human beings could exist. So, um, for instance, um, if the strength of gravity was slightly, slightly stronger, then the universe would have collapsed in on itself straight away after its creation, making any form of life impossible. Uh, an example fine-tuning is um, the formation of elements in the atomic table. So an atomic nucleus consists of protons and neutrons, and the, uh, the protons are red in colour and the neutrons are blue, and the electrons are yellow. So it looks like in the picture. Uh, the protons repel each other, so uh, why doesn't a nucleus blow itself apart? Uh, the reason is that there's another force called the strong nuclear force which uh, acts like superglue and binds the atom together. Um, and they are finely tuned against one each, uh, each other. So if the um, strong nuclear force was 2% stronger, you wouldn't have any hydrogen. So you wouldn't have water, hydrocarbons or life. If it was just 2% weaker, then the nucleus would blow apart. And so you'd have only hydrogen in the universe and the universe would be sterile. So the balance between the two forces is critical to the formation of the atomic table. In other words, the 100 or so elements that we know about. So this is the formal version of the fine-tuning argument. The fine-tuning of the constants in the laws of physics and the Big Bang initial conditions are due to law, chance or design. It is not due to law or chance, therefore it is due to design. And uh, a lot of the effort going in to justify this argument is to rule out law and chance and leave us with the only option, that is design. But we won't go there tonight. But this is the current status of the fine-tuning argument. Um, either you believe that the universe was designed by a designer or you believe that there are an infinite number of other universes with random physical laws and we happen to live in a lucky one. And uh, these other universes are a bit like Russell's teapot um, because you can't detect them. So you can't verify whether they are there or not. Um, there are a number of problems with the multiverse theory. The multiverse itself must be, the pro overall process to generate all the multiple universes must be finely tuned itself, so it doesn't get rid of the problem. Uh, we can only observe and test one universe, but which of the um, options is more plausible? Um, then there's a the moral argument. So if the cosmological and teleological um, arguments are uh, effective, then from them we could deduce that there was a creator, transcendent creator and designer of the universe. But he might have just kind of got the show started and then had no more concern about us, just let it run. So the issue is, is he interested in us? So there are two branches of belief in God. One's called deism, the other's called theism. So deism is uh, God just kick-started it, but God is impersonal and he doesn't care about us. And theism states that God is interested in us. The mor moral argument uh, actually leads us more toward, towards the belief that God is interested in us because he's interested in our morality. So the moral argument does not claim that atheists um, are immoral. We are all moral, but the question is why? So this is the formal uh, version of the moral argument. If God does not exist and objective moral values do not exist, objective moral values do exist, therefore God exists. So what are objective uh, moral values and um, uh, duties? Yeah, that should have actually said moral values and duties. So moral values, uh, an example of a moral value is uh, the value of human life. How valuable is that? An ex uh, example of moral duty is thou shalt not kill. So objective moral values are valid. Are those moral values that are valid and binding whether people believe in them or not? 
For instance, um, in the Second World War, you had Nazism, um, and um, if Hitler had won the war, would it, that have made him right? Uh, to say that moral values are objective would be to say that he was wrong, regardless of whether he won or not. So, whereas relative moral values are just a matter of personal taste. Atheism implies that there is no basis for objective moral values, but it seems fairly obvious to us that there is an objective basis for moral values. In other words, uh, atheism fails to justify what we experience in the moral realm. So people only maintain that moral values are relative until you are faced with examples. Was a Holocaust evil regardless of who won the war? Is pedophilia okay? Ped pedophilia, th pedophiles think it's okay. So that's their opinion. Is raping babies okay? If you actually pe give people these examples, then most people will recoil. And, um, but as soon as we admit that raping babies is objectively bad, then we actually affirm that objective moral values do exist. So the moral argument also goes beyond the cosmological and design arguments because the implication is that God must be interested in us. He's interested in how we behave and what we do. Um, the ontological argument is uh, quite fascinating. The um, uh, cosmological and design arguments have been around uh, way back into the Greek period when probably people thought about them a long time before that. But the ontological argument is strange in that um, it was invented by Anselm and as far as we can, uh, can detect, nobody ever thought of it before. Um, but it's um, uh, an argument that's fascinated philosophers. It doesn't have any uh, dependence on what we observe about the external world. It is a purely logical argument. The essence of the ontological argument is if it is possible that God exists, then God must exist. Uh, I hope to make that a bit clearer to understand why that is so as we go on. So uh, many people believe it is a valid argument, but not convincing. Um, Bertrand Russell said um, anyone can realise that looking at the ontological argument that it's rubbish. The trouble is nobody's ever been able to say why. <laughs> because it appears to be logical. Um, uh, William Lane Craig uses this uh, argument in debates but it's not covered in On Guard so you won't read about it in On Guard. It's, in a sense it's considered too esoteric for ordinary Christian believers. Um, we'll cover two form, forms, the one by Ansel uh, in the 11th century and also a more modern version by Alvin Plantinga. This is Anselm's version. He said, God by definition is the greatest conceivable being. To exist is greater than to not exist. If God does not exist, then it's possible to conceive of a greater being. Therefore, God exists. So that was roughly his form of the argument. It seems like it's playing tricks with your mind. But um, the, um, a lot of people uh, developed the argument. Uh, Rene Descartes did and Gottfried Le Leibniz did as well. They came up with their own versions. Um, but uh, it's been tightened up in recent times. This is Alvin Plantinga's version. He's uh, the former president of the American Philosophical Society. And his version of the argument is as follows. It is possible that a maximally great perfect being exists, which we'll call an MGPP. If it is possible that an MGPB exists, then he must exist in some possible world. That seems fair enough, doesn't it? Right, this is, this is the one that most people fall over. Next one. If he exists in some possible world, then he must exist in all possible worlds. All right. Therefore, a maximally great perfect being exists. In actual fact, premise three is not controversial amongst philosophers. The one they argue about is premise one. 
it is possible that a maximally great and perfect being exists uh, because they believe that all the rest of those arguments do actually logically follow. So the essence of the ontological argument is this. A, ne a necessary being is one who has to exist in all possible worlds. By very nature of, the, um, nature of their being, they have to exist. So if it is possible that a necessary being exists, then a necessary being must exist in all possible worlds. So it's possible, it must be that case. Just, cause just, uh, that's, why, that's how you actually make the connection between if it is possible that a maxly great perfect being exists, then he must... Um, so two says he must exist in some possible world. That seems reasonable. But if he can exist in some possible world, he must exist in all possible worlds. Because one of his properties of a maximally great perfect being is necessary existence. Now, uh, of course, people don't take this argument lying down. Um, one of the ways um, that the argument's been objected to is to use parodies. So when um, Anselm came out with his, um, his argument, um, it was challenged by a, a person called Giuliano or something like that, and um, with a parody. He says, um, well, why not have a greatest conceivable lion or the greatest conceivable um, island? And so followed the argument as, uh, uh, through using the same structure. And so uh, if a greatest conceivable being must exist, therefore greatest conceivable island must exist or greatest conceivable line. So that's one way of um, um, attacking the argument by the use of parodies, by showing that you can justify a whole lot of other things that are ridiculous using the same structure. Uh, so in a debate with uh, William Lane Craig, uh, with a guy called Victor Stenner, Stenger, he did a parody himself and talked about a maximally great pizza uh, to try and justify the existence of a maximally great pizza. And... Um, William Lane Craig's uh, response was, well, it's not possible that a maximally great pizza exists because a maximally great pizza would be eaten. <laughs> so the idea is in incoherent. So you actually have to postulate something that's coherent that is actually possible to exist. Um, uh, I've just been reading a uh, book called The God Question by A.C. Grayling, and his strategy is to say, if it is possible that a necessary being not exists, then a necessary being must not exist at all, or in all possible worlds. And the argument's actually quite correct. Um, if it is uh, possible that a necessary being not exists, then he can't exist. Um, but the, um, so it's an interesting point, but the thing he doesn't say is um, that if it is possible that a necessary being exists, then it is not possible that he doesn't. So the two are mutually exclusive. Um, and also he argues in a circle, he's saying it's obvious that it's possible that a necessary being not exists because he doesn't exist in this world. So he's actually begging the question and assuming his answer. All right, so that's the end of the ontological argument. Um, another set of arguments, these are not in on guard, um, but they are in other literature produced by reasonable faith. Uh, and it's to do with the nature of human beings. Um, if you're an atheist or materialist, uh, you say, they say that the physical world is all there is. So everything that happens is by the laws of physics. So you consider our bodies, we're composed of material, of um, atoms, elements, molecules, and they are banging into each other, interacting just like billiard balls on a table. And so uh, that leads you to determinism. So since you, everything that you do and think is a product of chemicals banging around, then there's only one possible outcome. So we think we have freedom of the will, but in reality we don't. It's an illusion. So um, that's not just my conclusion. Many atheists go down that route and say um, that our experience or perception that we have free freedom of the will is an illusion. In fact, uh, if you um, are put in, a, put in a given situation, 
it's only possible for you to make one choice. Whereas uh, people traditionally have uh, believed in what's called libertarian free will. So in a given set of circumstances, it is possible for you to make more than one choice. Does that mean that the universe as it uh, forms itself uh, predetermines that we were going to believe in God? Sorry? So what's the last bit? Predetermines that we were going to believe in God. Yes, even that, yeah. Um, so um, naturalism leads you to determinism, which leads to a denial of the freedom of will. It also uh, casts uh, questions on our ability to reason as well. Because uh, our perception of reasoning is we kind of have to detach ourselves from the objects and we actually think about. And in philosophy this is called intentionality. And intentionality cannot be explained under determinism. Because um, if all your thoughts are determined, they're not, they're not really thoughts. All right. Also, uh, it undercuts our moral ac accountability. So, um, if all our actions uh, are determined, then how can we be held accountable for them? So does that make sense? Um, and also, um, the very um, under naturalism, it's extremely uh, hard to explain human consciousness. Like, what is it that is behind your eyes that you have of your sense of identity that's associated with your body and nobody else's? It really is a mystery. Um, so none of these things are, seem explainable uh, under materialism or naturalism. And so the tendency of an atheist is to say, freedom of the will is, yes? Uh, just the Yeah, like quantum so mechanics. Like, yeah, quantum all right. Mechanics. So people have kind of explored this other option. All right, things can happen by chance due to quantum mechanics. Yeah, which could lead to some kind of a like Yeah. So there's a possibility to come out and say, all right, a behaviour is not determined. It uh, has a random component as well, but it still doesn't solve the problem. Yeah. So if your uh, choices are part determined, part random, they're still not your choices. So if your thoughts are either determined, if they're determined, they're not real thoughts. If they're random, they're not real thoughts, neither. So, and if your behaviour is kind of mixed or determined or random, you're still not accountable. I suppose that's just a, a, a method by which some sort of a um, non-deterministic uh, mechanism can be put into the... Hmm. Yeah. A pool table, or is it uh, all these other rules outside of things that would um, that be put into the oh, um, Yeah. That sort of. Yeah. yeah. Officially, I have to say no. <laughs> it's a different way. Of well, it sounds like arguing in a circle. Yeah. How does chaos theory fit into this? Well, chaos is the same as kind of chance. Like, if you if your behaviour is chaotic, it doesn't but then, then you're you know, accountable. Out of chaos, you can actually get patterns and mm. different things. So. All right. Yeah. I don't. I don't know. I'm just asking. Yeah. Yeah, but I don't think anybody's really come ha uh, up with a physical explanation of how uh, these, uh, you can have these facets. So um, what the atheists tend to say is all these uh, are ultimately illusory and at rock bottom we are zombies. But our perception is they're real. <laughs> and if they are real, then there's uh, deep problems with materialism. 
Other arguments. Um, the cosmological, teleological, moral and ontological arguments affirm that there exists a God who is creator, designer, the basis for uh, objective values and exists necessarily. So if they're valid, they're kind of building up this picture about God. Um, but these arguments, all the arguments I've talked about before are applicable to all monotheistic religions. So that includes Judaism, Christianity and Islam. Um, but we're going to consider two additional Christian arguments. Uh, one is the historical evidence for Jesus' re uh, resurrection and also the witness of the sp uh, Spirit in our Christian experience. So the re uh, resurrection's um, relevant to the existence of God in two, two different and opposite directions. Uh, first of all, if you have strong evidence for the uh, resurrection, that it, then it affirms a belief in God. All right? If um, Jesus rose from the dead, we have a miracle on our hands and it points to God. Um, but also it kind of works the other way. If you already believe in God, then it makes it easier to believe in the possibility of a resurrection. If you say God does not exist, then you have to uh, reject the resurrection out of, um, at all costs. You can't accept it no matter what. Um, so Stephen White is going to talk on this on the 24th of September, so uh, I'm only just going to touch on it very briefly. So um, the basis of it is that there are uh, three facts which actually re receive wide historical support. Um, the first is that um, all right, Jesus was died, was buried in a tomb, and when people came along on Sunday morning, that tomb was empty. And um, I won't go into the details of how that's justified, but that's uh, the fact that the tomb was empty on the Sunday morning is widely accepted by historians. Um, it's also widely accepted by historians that the disciples believed that Jesus appeared to them. So um, that's quite incredible. Like the evidence for that, that the disciples believed they saw the risen Jesus is uh, extremely strong. And um, also the, it's extra, ex, uh, accepted that the disciples sincerely believed in the resurrection. So uh, they've rejected uh, the idea that um, uh, the disciples made it up. Right. Um, so there have been attempts to explain those three historical facts and uh, some of the explanations are listed there. Uh, one is cons conspiracy, that they got together, drummed up the story to fool us. Uh, another one is Jesus didn't really die. Uh, but he um, revived in the tomb. Um, another uh, theory is um, they didn't know where he was buried and they went to the wrong place. Or else somebody came along during the night and popped at the body in a different spot. Um, the other is that um, the disciples had hallucinations in, when they thought that they saw the risen Jesus. Uh, but all these uh, alternative explanations um, that anybody's kind of dreamt up have been uh, basically rejected. Uh, so that kind of leaves you with the actual resurrection. But Steve's going to go through that in more detail. I also presented a talk on the argument for the resurrection from Paul, which I, I quite like. Uh, but that comes into this argument as well. Um, then there's the argument from personal experience. Um, now, personal experience of uh, interacting with God will vary with individuals. Um, and so my experience will not be the same as others. Um, but the way I experience it is often when I go, go to the Bible, I might uh, go to analyse it and see if I can find out something. But as I actually read it, quite often it jumps out to me. Instead of me analysing it, it analyses me. And while I actually read the Bible, I actually get a sense that God is speaking to me. So that's a common experience I have, and it's one way in which I have personal experience of uh, God. But other people will probably have entirely different experiences. So Perry's going to talk about this argument on the 25th of June. However, the problems with it are that other religions claim the same thing. 
Um, I, I often talk with a Muslim girl at work, and she talks about exactly the same thing, that she has personal experiences of God and how he answers prayer for her. So it's interesting how you respond to that. A uh, couple of arguments against God's existence. Uh, the two most common are the problem of evil and the hiddenness of God. So the problem of evil can be stated in this way. If God exists, then he would not allow pointless evil. There is pointless evil in the world, therefore God does not exist. Um, I like David Hume's formulation of the problem of evil. David Hume was a kind of the father of scepticism in many ways. He was a radical sceptic and he was uh, one of the key figures in the Enlightenment. Um, this is how he used to put it. Is God willing to prevent evil but not able? Then he is impotent. Is he able but not willing? Then he is malevolent. Is he both willing and able? Why then is there evil? These are some of the objections to the problem of evil. There are two major objections. One is the free will argument, and the other that it is impossible to prove that God does not have a purpose in allowing uh, evil. So the free will argument is basically uh, God made people with free will, and so it is logically impossible for God to prevent evil if humans have the ability to choose, if they choose evil. Um, and uh, the other is... Um, argument is that uh, we don't understand what happens in the world and um, so God may actually have his reasons that we don't understand. Um, but given uh, uh, this, um, you, uh, the argument from evil can actually be rearranged like Going back a couple of slides, it says, if God exists, he would, he would not allow pointless evil. There is pointless evil in the world, therefore God does not exist. So you can rearrange the argument like this. If God exists, then he would not allow pointless evil. God exists, see the other arguments. Therefore, there is no evil in the world that is pointless. All right, and you get some support for this in, in the Bible. So Proverbs 16.4 says, The Lord works out everything for his own purposes, even the wicked for the day of disaster. All right, the other argument is uh, the hiddenness of God. If God exists, why doesn't he show himself? Maybe God doesn't show himself because he doesn't exist. And the uh, um, answer to the, this, the Christian answer to this, is that God has shown himself. So he's shown himself in nature, uh, for example, as in Psalm 19. Um, how's that start? Yeah, and the earth displays his handiwork. And it goes on and on. So it's saying that uh, it's all blasting out as, uh, all the time, uh, but we uh, tend not to see it. All right. So he's revealed himself through the uh, nation of Israel, and he's revealed himself in Jesus of Nazareth, and he also reveals himself in that Christian experience. So the answer is, well, God doesn't hide himself. If you seek him, then you'll find him if you search for him with all your heart. So that's the promise. So what's um, the biblical pers uh, perspective on all these arguments? There is some grounds for them. Uh, like Psalm 19 says that the heavens declare the glory of God. So by looking at the world, should, we should be able to perceive something about God. And Romans 1 said God's qualities uh, are revealed in what he has made so that we are without excuse, but we suppress the knowledge of God. So the biblical perspective is consistent with both the cosmological and design arguments. So I like this um, quotation. Um, it's... Um, I was sat under a minister for uh, seven years in Tasmania. This is the only thing I can remember he said. Um, he says, Two men looked out of prison bars. One saw mud and the other saw stars. So you can actually look at the world, um, but you'll see different things depending on your attitude. This is a man who saw mud. Okay? This is Stephen Weinberg. He's the Nobel Prize winner in physics. And his view is the more the universe... Um, 
The more the universe seems comprehensible, the more it seems pointless. So he's, he's a cosmologist, he looks at the world, and he's come to the conclusion it's all pointless. Here's a man who saw stars. Uh, this is Paul Davies, he's not a Christian by any means, uh, but he came to believe in God through the fine-tuning of the laws of physics. He says, science is based on the assumption that the universe is thoroughly rational and logical at all levels. Atheists claim that the laws of nature exist reasonlessly and the universe is ultimately absurd. As a scientist, I find this hard to accept. There must be an unchanging rational ground in which the logical, orderly nature of the universe is rooted. Now, I'm getting close. It's 5-2. Uh, what do Australians really, uh, believe? These are census results over the last 100 years. And um, the bottom section is the Anglican Church, and that's in steady decline. Um, this section here is the Roman Catholic Church. Um, this is other Christian religions. Um, and so, but you can see that um, all right, most, most of the fall is due to the Anglican Church. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the Catholics have had slight uh, growth. And, but there's also been decline in uh, the uh, other Christians as well. We've had some increase in uh, the yellow is other religions. Uh, and uh, that's growing, and that's probably due to immigration. Um, then there's uh, the green section. This is no religion, so this has actually been a growing segment of our population. And the purple section is I don't know, or they didn't, we don't know, they didn't fill the census in properly. Um, but it is significant that there is a significant growth in people who have no religion whatsoever. And this is another graph which shows Australian religiosity. It's, so it's actually um, had a steady decline over the years. So summarising Australian's belief. Belief in God is still pretty high, but it is in decline. And atheism is a, still a minority, but it's growing. So those who believe in God, well, it could be a God of any sort, all right? So people are very diverse in what they, they believe. There's some sort of supernatural realm but uh, not necessarily a Christian belief. Um, about 50% of Australians identify themselves as religious, and, um, but only 10 to 20% attend church regularly, and only minority people are uh, specifically Christian. So the Christianity is definitely in decline as a proportion of the Australian population. And so the question is, why? What are the reasons for it? And could we possibly do anything about it? What are the factors that have been identified of unbelief in Australians? Um, the major reason is lack of confidence in the churches and religious uh, organisations. So in recent times you've had things like um, child abuse. Um, uh, there's also the perception that uh, the churches are very traditional. Uh, we've tried that and we're rejecting it. Uh, this has been something tried and failed, so let's go on to something new instead of trying this again. Um, also the perception that uh, people have a strong respect for science and people assume, hasn't science disproved God? Um, so a lot of people, even if they have that uh, belief, even though they may, it may be quite baseless, um, another reason is lack of attendance uh, at church as a child. So many of the modern generation don't go to Sunday school. And so they have no exposure. So they've, um, they're basically pagans. So they, they haven't had any uh, start in that area at all. Then there's a belief that religions uh, bring conflict. Like discussions on religion are ob um, ob sometimes a taboo subject. You, like you're not supposed to talk about it because people get worked up about it, so keep it to yourself. So the two taboo subjects are uh, religion and politics. All right, so you, you don't talk about it. Um, then there's stereotypes in the media, the way Christians are presented in the uh, media. Like if you uh, see a picture of people in the church, there are old people standing off of um, wooden pews singing, all things bright and beautiful. Um, with a crummy old organ in the background. Um, there's also secular domination of the media 
And many people just believe that religion is no longer relevant to the daily life. I can get along with my life quite happily without any religion. Thank you very much. So other factors um, against um, uh, belief is just plain apathy and distraction. So people have got so many things in their lives uh, that they haven't got time to stop and think. Uh, technology and consumerism, so you look at people and they're playing with their phone. <laughs> and, um, and also um, the media is very secular. Now what things actually um, encourage people to believe, well one of the strong factors are role models. So that could be uh, your parents, if you get a good role model from your parents or your teacher or your minister, then that actually has a, a bigger impact on uh, um, people believing. So um, it's not necessarily because people don't find these arguments uh, convincing or not, it's because they never look <laughs> and they're not interested. And these are some, what, some uh, things that I've um, kind of identified as core issues for atheists in uh, terms of what at rock bottom, why do they actually oppose it? Why do they, do they actually raise all these objections to the arguments? Because the objections are not really um, the thing that disturbs them. They have other reasons. Um, one of them is, this came out with John Chandler, um, but it's common. The inconceivability of an unembodied mind. All the minds that we see are embodied in a brain. So we have a wonderful instrument called the human brain and that actually allows us to perceive and think. Um, but God is spiritual. He's not made of material. So how can you actually have an unembodied mind? It's uh, hard for us to conceive. So this uh, basic issue that I've identified amongst atheists and John Chandler thought that way. Um, also, uh, if God is responsible for creating the world and designing it, then God must be incredibly complex. So how do you explain God? So God is not exp uh, explanation because it, you're just pushing the problem back one, one level. Uh, then there's the Copernican principle. Uh, People used to believe that the sun rotated at the, around the earth and um, we were the centre of the universe and we were the centre of God's interests. Then along came Copernicus and said, no, in fact, the earth rotates around the sun. So, hmm, you mean the sun's the centre, not us. And then we uh, started to uh, realise that uh, we're just rotating and all the stars are so far away and they're much bigger than us. Then we discovered that there's other galaxies. Uh, worked out there's probably 10 billion stars in the Milky Way. There's over 10 billion galaxies. We see, so we've, the Earth has uh, been perceived as being progressively smaller and smaller and insignificant. So um, if that's the case, what's it all about? Then there's the other principle that um, observing nature. If God made it, why is there so much violence in nature? Why is it red in tooth and claw? It doesn't seem to be the work of a benevolent creator. So these are some of the, um, what I perceive as being core issues for atheists and the reason why they raise so many other objections. So um, I've got some questions to stimulate a discussion, if you, but I presume you've, hopefully you have <laughs> your own set of questions and comments. So what do you actually think of Russell's teapot? So the early, early slide. Um, are arguments about the existence of God important? So if we try to come up with these arguments for the existence of God, is it really going to have much impact? Um, does it make much difference in uh, people's attitude towards Christianity? or do people operating on, on another level. Like, uh, maybe we need uh, more guitars and smoke machines and flashing lights. 
<laughs> maybe that would be more effective in attracting people rather than uh, preventing uh, rational reasons for believing in God. The other issue, are Australians really interested? And if not, how do we actually get them interested? And uh, how do we respond to apathy? What do we do about it? And if people believe that God is not relevant to modern life, is that actually true? And in, uh, so in what way is God relevant to a modern life? So I'll leave it there. Well, thank you. Um, I'm sure there's a few questions that uh, people have got, and um, it certainly sparked some debate around the um, table there. So, um, without further ado, I'll ask people to um, ask questions. They can direct it through the chair or through through Kevin. It doesn't matter to me, but I will interrupt if I think that the, uh, the subject's getting off off topic. Mm. So, thank you. Everybody has a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it can also be a comment and statement. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 I was going to say that, but um, I, I said that last time, so... Right. Yeah. Unfortunately, I thought of things as we were going through, but then you go on to the next one and it puts it out of my brain. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I can recommend a good doctor. Yeah, so. <laughs> <laughs> We've actually got some cues on the slide there. Yeah, so... All right, what do you think of Russell's teapot? He's inferring that God is like a, a, a teapot flying between Jupiter and uh, uh, Mars, and um, the, you haven't got, you can't prove or disprove. So, um. the thing is, Russell is not claiming to have actually seen it himself, so that one has to believe him. He's just making it up out of his head. Whereas people who say they believe in God, there are certain people who claim to have personally experienced this God. Whether their experience is real or not is another matter, but they claim to have first-hand experience, which is another level completely. I think it's also fair to say, if I may, that Russell's wrote that before the fine-tuning argument was uh, postulated. Mm. Um, there was a guy called Anthony Flew who died, I think it, he died around about 2008, I think. Um, he was a famous atheist of the 20th century and uh, he changed his mind. It wasn't due to the fine-tuning argument, it was uh, more due to the um, impossibility of uh, life being formed without, uh, by natural causes. Um, but he was, had uh, inter various interviews with um, oh, just a guy, Malcolm one of the apologists, sorry? Malcolm Muggeridge. No, no, he's a guy who argues for the resurrection, the... Um, Gary Habermas? Sorry? Gary Habermas? Habermas, yeah, it was, Gary Habermas. And uh, Habermas asked him um, if um, uh, people like Bertrand Russell and Jim Mackey were alive now, would they still be atheists? And uh, uh, because there's a lot of evidence uh, that they didn't have access to, uh, which uh, Flew thought were quite decisive. So, um, uh, I, I don't know, a lot of it's run by people's attitudes anyway. Um, but maybe they would have uh, thought differently if they had been aware of current evidence. I'll offer a comment, if I yeah. might. Um, I, I personally, this is a personal perspective, but this is a, um, an argument that will, so long as humans exist, will be going on forever, I don't believe there isn't, we will ever figure out whether there is an art, there is, it's, a, it's just a, a part of being human that we will want to search for it, mm -hmm. but the more we search and the finer tuning, we, and the, you know, the more we get down into the detail, the more we find there's more detail further on that's yeah. um, you know, going to confuse it. So <coughs> I, that's where I stand and I um, just accept it nowadays rather than try to find, to try to prove by some philosophical argument or some belief of mine or some experience that I've had, um, as you say, they're, they're unique. So I, I believe it's, a, it's an ongoing question, ongoing question that we're always going to pose. It's not to say we shouldn't do it, mm. but that um, it, it is one of those things and that everybody will have a different perspective. And, and, mm. and to reach, then what I'm, I'm saying from that is to reach Australians, you've got to address, I think, not only the arguments you've talked about, but why uh, why don't they um, 
you, I mean, you, you, I, I, I think there's some points you put up at the, at the end are, are good ones about why um, Australians don't attend church or don't mm. follow religion anymore or too much, or that they believe in God. But and I think, it, yeah, I think personally, it's, uh, I think they feel the churches and the and the religious institutions and the institutions have, have let them down or failed them or uh, been a bit. Too, too radical, or, or some, somehow affected them in their in their life, and I can speak from, from family situations in that regard. Mm. So, um, so I think um, maybe from a personal perspective, I, I'm a more of a um, emotional person. So I may not have, I'm a science uh, engineer and scientist by background, but I think um, we need to also look at the emotional aspects of it, the conscious part of it, mm. as well as the pure rational thinking yeah. part of it. So that's that's a comment. That's not really, but it might um, it might engender um, some further discussion. Right. So you prefer the flashing lights and the smoke machines? Mm. Well, I think that was an unfair <laughs> criticism. <laughs> 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 comment. A lot of young um, people do I don't think prefer the, the smoking, flashing lights, and being entertained, mm. and they find um, church not entertaining enough. Mm. It's a cultural thing, isn't it? Oh, it's a good yeah. point. You're right. Church and out outside. But I, I taught school for a long time, and I found if I got onto a subject which I allowed myself to get onto, like the Devil's Triangle, and or, or uh, water divining, things of that nature, things which have a you know sort of a supernatural aspect to it, the kids are absolutely riveted. They're riveted, and someone would love me to talk about God too. And I said, well, I can't. I have your parents' permission. You know, that sort of thing, I've got to get out of it. But they, they, I think it's wrong to say that they're not interested. I think they're probably very, very interested, but they just don't see it in, in, in a priest doing this sort of business and, and wearing penny robes and that sort of thing and, and attending church all the time and, and all, the, all, that, all that practice that goes with it. It's a different culture. Mm. Well, you think 100 years ago, and I was reminded of this, uh, there was an opening of the old, anniversary of the Institute in Salisbury up there. And as you read the history of it, the Institute was put there because there was no radio. There was no TV. There was no movies. If people wanted anything socially interactive to go and see, anything of that sort, you went to something like the Institute and watched someone either play music or do a play or something like that. That was the only form mm, of entertainment to today. Mm. Do it on here, yeah, yeah, go to watch the movies. There is so much else mm -hmm. that distracts me from worrying about that stuff. Mm. In Isaiah, I think God, God feels the same way as young people. God's sick and tired of it. He said, I'm sick of you with the way you're carrying on with your, your, your lots of prayers and your, 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 the way you're, you're doing your sacrifices. I'm sick to death of it. It's, it's, it's up, you, you know what I'm talking about? It stinks to me. And I, I should imagine, and I go to church, and I should imagine God gets pretty sick and tired of us too. It's not just, it's not dynamic, it's not interesting. Nobody really believes what they say anyway. Look, well, I, I exaggerate, but an awful lot don't. <laughs> <laughs> and around a cup of tea and Mickey's, if you start something controversial, you get a few come in, but uh, not, not others sort of stand back with a bit naughty. But I think if some of them are interesting, interested, but they're not into the way it's expressed. Mm. Kevin said that it was a poem on hell. Is hell any relevant to anyone these days? Well, it's a bit of a taboo subject, isn't it? It's an embarrassment. It's an embarrassment to the church. Yeah. Well, no, not to the church. Mm. Well, I, 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 a lot of people in the church feel as though it's an embarrassment, it's a topic you avoid. Ah, um, but, you know, some will go for it as yeah. well. Mm. Mm. well. I think that's one of the answers. People have nothing to fear, so why worry? Mm. How could a God of love send people to hell? Mm. That's the common thought. Mm. Well, the common answer is he does it. They send themselves to hell, they're not believing in him. And that when they sin, God's judgment is instantly against them. He, he judges people instantly. 
is said uh, yeah. somewhere, I was watching, I mentioned here once before, the devil hasn't got away with anything, not even half a second. Mm. As soon as he commits a sin, God abandons him to the sin. And he goes deeper into sin. And he does it again, and God abandons him again. And it's that abandonment that is, is, that is hell. It tells you in the book of Revelation, God's going to pour out four or five, something or other on the earth, and it says for each one of them, and they still didn't repent. In the Old Testament, there was a prophet who was said, look, God, I'm not going to talk to them anymore. They won't. They won't <coughs> change their ways. And God says, I know they won't. You keep telling them about it. Mm. That's judgment. That's an amazing uh, verse that's in Isaiah 6. Because uh, 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 God asks, uh, who will go? And the, uh, uh, Isaiah responds, says, here am I, send me. And um, then God says to him, go to a people who will not listen. Mm. Uh, Harden their hearts. <laughs> and that verse is quoted several times in the New Testament, but not the other stuff in Isaiah. Mm. Mm. But uh, back to your point about, you said uh, it gets confusing when you go into the argument. Mm. And uh, I think you're quite right. So if you go to the cosmological argument, start mm. reading books and counter arguments, then you go on the web. Mm. And it just goes deeper and deeper and gets more and more bewildering. Um, yes, you know more and more about this and listen. Yeah, the, you get, the more, the more you look, the more you get confused. That's right. It's like trying to uh, approach infinity or the approach of the smallest dot. You know, there's always an, another point beyond it, you know. Mm. So, but that's a, that's a common experience. There's just so much knowledge out there. If you go into any subject, it's like that. True, true. Mm. But when you come back to the fundamentals, though, I think as people, we will never understand it totally. It's, we're not meant to. No. So. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't <laughs> uh, expect yeah. that these arguments are proofs. No. Um, but like, um, I, I like John Locke. Now, Leonard Long doesn't like John Locke, but I like John Locke. Uh, but um, I don't agree with him with everything he said. Uh, but uh, he, he said that when we're born, we're born as a blank slate and that everything we learn comes in via our senses. Uh, now, some people disagree with them. They say we know some things innately without uh, coming through the senses. All right. It's but he gives us a picture that um, we have our five senses and we have a brain. So we've got inputs from our senses and we've got a brain to actually make sense of what we see. And um, I, th I think there's a, a big truth in it. They, most of us do have five senses in the brain and it's our responsibility to actually make sense of the world. And we see everything and we see all the competing uh, opinions and it's our responsibility to form good conclusions out of it. And uh, God's given us that responsibility. Now, maybe because of our sin that's insufficient and we need a bit of help. But we're still responsible for what we see and hear and how we mm. think about it. I suppose one of your questions is, are arguments about the existence of God important? Um, right. As has been kind of suggested by a few people here tonight, so far as most people around about us are concerned, they don't want to go into that nitty gritty. But nevertheless, no. it's still important for a small number who do get interested and go into it to be able to demonstrate to everyone else that you can believe in God without having to check your brains at the door. Mm. Um, that you can believe in God and believe in science to have knowledge and degrees. You mm. can believe in God and be a logical thinker. Yeah. Whether you're right or wrong is another matter. Uh, but you don't have to throw out all sense, logic or otherwise to believe in God. Mm. Read John Lees was at Oxford, didn't we? Mm. Mm. Professor of Mathematics at Oxford. The, one of uh, William Lane Craig's points that he makes, and it's probably a bit naughty, uh, is that the people who do gravitate to these arguments um, are the ones you really want to affect <laughs> because um, they are they're likely to be the deep thinkers who have uh, become the leaders in society. So, uh, not when you think... Mm -hmm. C.S. Lewis is an example. Yeah. So, um, the people who will be interested in these arguments are probably... Uh, have a fair bit of sway in society. So, so why do you, uh, the question then is, why do you think that um, the, 
there are there are obviously Christian scientists. Mm -hmm. Why don't they present an alternative argument to the um, atheists who are making the big bangs at the moment, the big mm -hmm. noises, in a way that's um, clear? Mm. Well, I think they often do, but it's just a question of who holds the microphone. Yes. Yeah, so you're saying the media is partly it, or mm. well, why do it? <coughs> Well, who grabs people's uh, attention? Is it the person who gives a reasonable argument or is it the person who says something that's outlandish and it tickles people's ears? You'll often see on the first or second page an announcement about a new discovery of a fossil which has proved something. I mean, let's take those Indonesian pygmies, the, the, the hobbits or whatever they were called. It was great fanfare. I think you have to now probably tuck away on the back page somewhere. It came out in Christian journals because that's what it's actually said. But tucked away somewhere as they said, no, these were actually just dwarfs, like dwarf-like creatures who just happened to band together. But mm. you don't find that on the second or the first page, it's now... Yeah, the retraction it, is it, on the, the back retraction page. retraction is on the back yeah. page, mm. in, in the fine print. I don't, don't think there's been a retraction on that one. But well, that's, I mean, that's, you'll that's, find, that's just a, a but point, you'll find, you okay, if there's any backtracking, it's, it's never... But that's not a big deal for me. Um, it's more to do with the fact that there's no... Um, I don't think a scientist necessarily needs to get into the argument on that because um, it, it's controversial or people, even Christians, have different views on it. So therefore you can't, as a Christian, you shouldn't be coming out against one Christian view or another. And I'm more talking about the principles, the, um, uh, the caring, you know, the, you know, the things we stand for, you know, the, the, the common things, not those, the, the outer points of belief. Do unto others as you had to do unto yourself, and you know the resurrection, things like that. Things that are more fundamental. They're more very personal, yeah. aren't they? Yes, they're more personal. That's why I said my minds are more personal. It's like as like if you, you know you you you've got and a I'm friend or, the, um, or your spouse or something, and you say, okay, now honey, I'm going to look through this book and see whether you're real or not, and, and things like that. And then you go into a great deep philosophical argument about your your spouse or something. And, the, and you just start getting a bit cold about the whole thing, mm, mm. you know. But with, with Christianity and with, with God, it's usually a personal thing, and that's mm. why. Some, are the arguments of the existence of God important? Yes, and for some people they are, but for most people they're not. It's nice, uh, something which appeals to their emotions and their feelings. That's what. That's what about relationships. That's mm. what it's all about. Yeah, but there are a lot of people. The Christians that have stood up to a lot of tyranny and things like that, mm. and they're not made talked about and made heroes, really. No, Bonhoeffer is. Uh, yeah, Bonhoeffer, but uh, and in South America there are lots of people, okay. but they that they may have the wrong political belief or something, you know, or they may be slightly sus on something else, but they are, I'd consider them Christian. You know? Well, there is one. I think it was, it was one coming up the anniversary of the death of one was at San Salvador or somewhere where he stood up and was murdered, I think, mm. one of the guys who tried to stand up for the, the poorer people in one of those, El Salvador mm. it was, yeah, mm. the, mm. uh, against the... Uh, That's right. I, I'm only using that as an example, um, saying we're not, we don't make heroes of those people. Or, um, and, uh, that's the wrong word, I suppose. Make heroes of people who are acting in movies. Mm. Mm. But yeah, uh, you know what I'm trying to say is that and surprisingly, in my experience, uh, uh, I've kind of worked with the working class people a lot, and they have um, a lot of um, objections that um, are very similar to these sort of things, like who made God? I only believe in what I can see and touch. Mm -hmm. And all these sort of things, they're uh, pretty basic comments that people make, and I think we still need to have some sort of reasonable yes, response right. to it. Yes, or you need to have a, dis you need to have a discussion around it. Mm. So they can reach the conclusion, but uh, I believe because, my personally, that there's no clear answer to it, you have to have another string to your bow. Mm. Okay. Um, it won't. It, it won't convince. It wouldn't convince me alone to become a Christian. No. I don't and think that's the point. And you brought in about Jesus of Nazareth and his resurrection and things. So mm. you have to do the to, to the, that was your uh, that I, you know that's how you were doing. Together. Mm. I don't think it's supposed to convince people to become Christian so much as there are certain people out there who will not become a Christian because for them this is a sticking point. And if you can do away with that sticking point, then it helps them to move on. Mm. Yeah, and I'm, 
guess personally, I'm more interested in the. Oh, I'm taking I'm taking the chair. I realise I shouldn't. I'm guilty. Um, You're railroading me. I am. I, <laughs> I just realised I've just done it. Um, <laughs> no, it's all right. Um, I, I mean, uh, those people might be only. I mean, are you saying? I mean, I'm, I'm a working class person anyway, but um, you say they object to um, that idea that well, who made God? If you can have a discussion around that, but then ultimately you want them to, or you'd like them to believe, become a Christian. Mm. So there's got to be some other argument to it, because the, the, I believe the 50% of the people that are profess, profess belief in God of some sort, mm. they're the people that we should be targeting, not the, mm. the 5% on the outside, the atheists that we probably never convince. I know at Holy Trinity they, they have a big push um, to read the Bible with somebody. Mm. And so uh, as people actually uh, read the Bible, then that engages them. Mm. And uh, they get sucked in or whatever. Mm. But um, uh, but you, uh, people have to have a level of um, a belief that Jesus, uh, that Jesus and um, Christianity is at least credible to start looking at it. Um, so, mm. yeah. So yes, that's a good point. So what, where is that? Um, yeah, I don't have is, all the answers. Is, yeah, is, is it the discussion or attending a meeting like this, or mm. is it? Um, yeah. It's linked one to one with Bible reading. Is one is one aspect of it. Mm. Yes. But you, how do you get the person to even do that? Offer it. Hmm? Offer it. Um, offer mm. it. Provide food. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now you're getting something. <laughs> Good food. Have, have a beer. It was smoking, especially yeah. once. Yeah. yeah. That one about uh, Russell's teapot, I was thinking about it. It's the question about, say, about God is really it's just the word. And you, you can't prove prove it one way or the other because you've got to say something about God. He did something uh, before you can start to sort of try to justify or, or not to justify mm -hmm. God. So for example, if you take uh, uh, God created the heavens and the earth in six days and all that sort of thing, then, then you're not looking at a teapot way out there. You're looking at a God that did something right here and there. And you can test that to see whether it all took six days or, or longer. Yeah, whatever the answer is. But uh, you, you can actually test it and, and then you say, okay, it took six days. We've got proof of that. It took six days and therefore maybe the God of the Old Testament mm -hmm. is, uh, is the real McCoy. He, he, the Old Testament said he did that in six days and there it is, he did do it in six well, days. At the very least, we've got proof that um, the universe is here. I agree with you. Yeah, the universe might come other ways besides a, a divinity. I was going to say, I agree with Russell's teapot and the way that he uses it. He says someone couldn't just say something was out there without having to give some sort of justification for that. Mm. You couldn't just make any claim that you wanted and just get away with it. I mean, people have to accept it. The way that, that you guys are looking at it is that um, you're using God as a hypothesis to explain other phenomena, other things that have happened. So he's not using the teapot as a hypothesis for anything. He's just saying it's out there. Whereas if you were looking at arguments, you'd be saying, well, actually, no, we think that there is a God as a result of other things. What he's talking about, he's probably talking about people who just say there is a God without having any actual reason for saying mm. that. I think he, one of the things he intended to say is that people who um, assert that a God exists, they have some burden of proof, mm. right? Uh, so it's not an issue of saying, all right, uh, uh, the burden of proof is on the atheist to prove that God doesn't exist. So if you assert that God exists, you're making a positive claim, so you should have some reasons for it. So you're the one that has to find the evidence rather than the lack of evidence type thing? Yeah. There was by the time he came around, there were all sorts of bits of evidence, like things that Kevin was mentioning tonight. Mm. Obviously, it's the resurrection. Now, to those that were there at the time, of course, it, it 
must have been something dramatic, or otherwise they wouldn't have written what we now know as the New Testament. Of course, well, it's 2,000 years later, oh, maybe they made it up or something, but at the time it appears something happened that they believed, and uh, so we have to say, well, that was something for them. Is it relevant to us? What's he done recently? <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, look, I've, I've been shot down by Kevin a few times on this one, or whatever. This is the, the preservation of the Jews. To me, that is one of the great mm. historic evidences that the, the God of the Old Testament, and indeed parts of the New Testament, is still very much, despite everything that's been thrown at them. Mm. Was it Napoleon that said that? Was it Napoleon that said that? Who was it? Uh, I think it was. Uh, it was actually, I think it was Voltaire to uh, Frederick the Great. Frederick the Great said, "What's the proof of the Bible?" And I think it's reported, and I can stand corrected here. But it was Voltaire who said, "Sire the Jews," because hmm. in every European city at the time, you'd see these little ghettos with guys all dressed in black, uh, very much despised by much of the population, but. Um, they were still preserved and they were evidence that what we read in the Old Testament is still there in front of them today. And despite the Holocaust, despite, read the story of the, the War of Independence in 48, where all the Western countries had written off Israel because all the Arab armies had been trained by the West, um, well armed by the West, are going to roll right in and uh, it just didn't happen that way. Actually, in terms of um, that sort of thing, uh, a thing I find encouraging in reading the Bible is, is a lot of mundane sort of prophecies. Like when the Magnificat, um, Mary says, from now on, all nations shall call me blessed. Well, I hope. <laughs> yeah. How did she know? Like, uh, uh, all right, the words may have been put in her mouth by Luke or something, but when Luke wrote that, there were probably only a few thousand Christians around. And a pretty insignificant mob, and by golly, she was right. Uh, and um, also, like when uh, you have the woman anointing Jesus' feet, mm -hmm. and she says, and he says, from this day forth, all nations, this story will be told in all nations, or something. All the world will know what she did. He's right. <laughs> um, and there's uh, lots of things like that, and some of them are pretty mundane, mundane like. Uh, Jesus tells the parable of the sower. He says there's four types of people. That's what you observe. <laughs> That's how people react. He says, you shall be persecuted. And that's historically true. It's happened <laughs> for 2,000 years ever since. There's lots of things in there, uh, like uh, without necessarily Jesus uh, predicting a particular event, he states general principles that we can actually see happening all the time ever since. 